Welcome back to Season 2 of That's So Second Millennium, the Catholic Science Podcast, where we look forward to the new synthesis in the new millennium between faith, philosophy, and science. Welcome back, friends, to our first episode, our first full-length episode after the Society of Catholic Scientists Conference. This is Episode 63 of That's So Second Millennium. I, it was a great conference. Uh, it was a great experience, and so many things went just right. Um, there was one large thing that did not go just right, and that was uh, yours truly's ability to uh, set things up in the interview room for optimal audio quality. So we had we recorded a number of interviews. We talked to while we were there. We talked to Marine Conduct for an hour and a half. Um, it was a great talk, a great interview. Um, we talked to Father Lawrence Mashia and Daniel Vandenberg at. St. Vincent. They, they are at St. Vincent's College in Pennsylvania. And then we talked to Karen Oberg. Uh, so she's a member of the board. She didn't speak at this conference. We'll be releasing that interview after we release all the interviews of conference speakers. We have a couple of interviews coming up next week. Uh, we'll be talking to Sansoles de la Caille at Ohio University. She's an Ohio bobcat. Uh, yes, and yes, she's from France. Uh, she has an interesting life story in, in, in that. I'm looking forward to talking to her and to uh, Benjamin Rybicki at the um, Henry Ford Cancer Institute in Detroit. So, as that in- might indicate, uh, we had a wide variety of people involved at the conference. So, fortunately, those interviews will go on after I have had the chance to uh, try to do things a little bit better. I did not do a good job of setting up the uh, my laptop and my microphone and the settings and just generally the environment there at the at the conference. Uh, we had this, so what we're actually leading off with here is this panel discussion uh, that I uh, managed to arrange, and, and two very interesting people volunteered to join us. Jeffrey Woolard, a cancer researcher at the University of Toronto, they give you know more full introductions of themselves at the beginning of the discussion, and Marissa Newton, a philosophy instructor at uh, the University of New England. She teaches philosophy of science, hence her interest in being at the SCS conference. In any case... This is this is the first time I've resorted to having uh, someone professionally edit the audio. Uh, this is the best they could do. I did not. I'm a saver. I'm a saver. Um, it was just too good a conversation to just completely throw it out. Um, it gets a little difficult to understand what's going on. Of course, it gets particularly difficult for me because I have tinnitus, so I have every hope that most of you with more ordinary uh, hearing abilities will get more out of it. Um, if you find it difficult, a uh, given stretch and just you can't bear it anymore, skip ahead a few minutes um, because the quality does go up and down. So if there's if there's a difficult stretch, uh, just I, I would I would definitely recommend skipping ahead a couple of minutes and then getting back to one of the better sections. Um, I will be releasing the other half of this. This is the worst half. This first half was worse than the second half. Um, and then the interviews, while not what they should be. I should have uh, I should have set things up better even before the interviews, but the interviews are better audio quality than this. So don't be don't be dissuaded by this episode. Um, if you know if you really get that tired of it, yeah, by all means skip it. Uh, try next week's, and if you get tired of next week, skip it. Then then Marine Conduct will be better. Don't miss Marine Conduct. Just please don't miss Marine Conduct. It's too good. Um, she's just talking about too many interesting things. Welcome back to episode sixty three of That So Second Millennium broadcast, well, not live, but recorded here at the Society of Catholic Scientists Conference 2019 at the University of Notre Dame. So this is my partner in crime, Bill Schmidt. Hello, Tom. And we're happy to be joined by Jeffrey Wooler and Marissa Newton, two of the attendees of the conference this year. So we're going to have a little panel discussion and break down the talks that we saw and uh, get enlightenment from people who are uh, going to bring a very different and probably superior perspective to uh, the <laughs> usual. <laughs> you've heard, Bill, you've heard Bill and I for a while, so yeah. why don't you introduce yourself real briefly for the uh, for the audience? Um, sure, my name is Marissa Newton, and um, I teach philosophy of science at University of New England. I'm very interested in all the correlations between religion, science, and faith, and, and philosophy. Um, so this conference has been really enlightening for a number of reasons. I'm really feel privileged to be here. Yeah. 
Yeah, we met last year actually at the one in DC. And yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's been great to, uh, to remake your acquaintance and hear yes, more, too. Uh, more war stories from the front. <laughs> there are many. Uh, yeah, that's right. I you know if they're listening right now, uh, I may not have a job next uh, week. But, uh, yeah. um, I, I, the likelihood that they're listening to this podcast is probably pretty slim. Yeah, we have to be a major mistake. What are you, Jeff? I'm Jeff Willard. I'm from the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. I'm a first year PhD student in medical biophysics. Okay. So I'm using electron microscopes to determine the atomic structures of calcium ion channels. And today, uh, this conference I presented some work I've been doing on attitudes towards cancer. Yeah. Uh, why not live forever? Right. From, uh, from books to bench to biotech to bedside. Mm -hmm. Texts mm -hmm. from ranging that whole gamut of Okay. Did you present that poster on Friday? Or yeah, it's Friday. Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Can you actually see an electron through this microscope, or you can only you see birds exist? The, the electrons. electrons help you see. You are seeing the. Uh, you're basically doing a billion cell experiment. Wow. There is one electron traveling at a time through that oh, tabletop microscope column. It is going at like 0.7 the speed of light. Wow. Yeah. That's it is incredible. diffracting. And the magnetic lenses are gathering back together. Those wave functions are collapsing on the detector. Yeah. Like, that's, that's what you're seeing. That's, what you're that's doing. incredible. It's an amazing thing. That's, that's incredible. Awesome. And what yeah. does that look like to the naked eye that's not so naked? Well, you start to yeah. you zoom out and you see this three millimeter, three millimeter diameter grid. Mm. And then you zoom in and you can do it continuously. Mm -hmm. and that's the one I've been using. And you see little speckles and dots mm -hmm. and then you zoom in and you zoom in and that sort of new stage of lenses kicks in and it has a little flicker but basically it's continuous and then oh. uh, you start to see fine structural detail of the mm -hmm. protein yeah and there it's like looking at it from above very yeah. cool yeah. Mm -hmm. and those electrons are pretty energetic and they interact with that material pretty strongly they they have a wavelength of uh, picometers yeah. And you're resolving um, details uh, on the sort of nanometer, sub nanometer scale uh, mm -hmm. uh, with millions of, of copies of this identical object of this protein to optimally be yeah. of. And then you have to realign them and average them together to get sharp details and go back to the you're looking at it in 3D. Wow. In 3D. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, how do you know? Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And of course, my, my research is on you know, X-ray diffractions, which is, of course, not quite as cool because you know, electrons are pretty, pretty awesome. They interact with matter much more strongly, so you don't need as much diffracting volume for electrons. I'm sure you've got some electrons floating around in your X-ray diffraction. There's definitely <laughs> some electrons. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you get, you get X-ray. off the electrons. And then you're imaging the electrons. Oh, so back wow. to what you were talking about. You're using oh. the X-rays basically to see where the electrons Oh. You have to be careful okay. for X-ray radiation from the electron microscope. Oh, really? Yeah. Like your body. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 So yeah. fascinating. We won't we won't turn this into a lecture on you know, <laughs> you know structural biology, K, K alpha lines, and you know, so forth. As, as fascinating and as much fun as I had when I was teaching that, we'll move back to the conference. Um, so we have had a jam-packed couple of days here from Friday evening and the poster session through talks all day yesterday culminating with Michael Flynn's um, wandering through uh, Western Germany in the, uh, in the mid 14th century for uh, talking about Eichelheim and his science fiction book set in that, set in that era. Um, and then today we had three more talks and a poster session. So we had a, we had a lot of content and it went all over the place. So uh, why don't we, why don't we just, you know, what, 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 were you, what was the most memorable moment for each of you? Hmm. I have to say I really liked uh, Connor Cunningham's talk, um, <laughs> <laughs> although everyone said that was the most sporadic talk at the conference, which that's, it was. That's true. That's, that's um, it was. That's, true. That was a fair assessment. Yeah. Um, I really liked what he did gathering together truth from all these different historical, philosophical sources. I mean, obviously he's not in favor of everything Nietzsche said, he's not in favor of everything Ford Buck said, but he definitely yeah. could pull the truth out of these different authors that are all searching for the same thing. I mean, ultimately searching for, for truth, even if they don't recognize it. And um, I really liked what he said about the Eucharist uh, being the only living thing that we 
eat. I'd have to talk to a biologist about plants, but I do think that um, this idea that it's yeah. fully alive, <laughs> yeah. the Eucharist yeah. is a body and blood of Christ, fully alive, that it really causes this really deep ontological change um, in us. I liked what he said about that. And then I also liked what he said about just getting back to the phenomena, like getting back to the things at hand, getting back to the sense of mystery and awe in front of what we encounter in nature. I, uh, well, there's so many good ones, and I want to put forward uh, one that could, it's like a hidden gem that right. might be one of the so, so this de la Calle thought on yeah. neurobiology of emotions yeah. and the evidence of human interdependence, because it really brings together a lot of fields. Yeah. Uh, I think her last quote, oh, I forget who it was from, I don't know, I'm going to ask you for but it was something like the, the, the kind of rigor of science, the wisdom of a clinician, and uh, it's really important for us to be able um, to, in our in our desire to know how nature works, shouldn't that help us relate to the natural world and restore harmony? And what you know, what what kind of better way than how we have bond with each other? Yeah, yeah. I'll keep those thoughts out for that. Yeah, I was I was uh, just the way she did it. You know, yeah, it makes it nice to mm-hmm. Yeah, and we've been, uh, and actually in the course of the podcast over this year, we've been trying to talk a little bit more about that sort of boundary between science, faith, and uh, you can personal see, life. You can see how uh, someone who has common sense, someone who has a, has a big heart yeah. uh, that's, that's been nourished by their faith, mm-hmm. it will, um, an interesting experiment will come to mind. It will help them in the hypothesis generation. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I mean, it's not doesn't give you the answer. You have to right. sweat. You have to show the measure. You have to read yes. the papers and yeah. go to stacks. <laughs> but that, yeah, but that that moment of insight to give you the idea and then go and test, you know, that uh, I mean, you need to be in a certain state for those ideas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some research being guided by this kind of like very human uh, desire to help your fellow man to understand reality. But once the posters was kind of about that. Oh, really? Um, he was right across from where I had my mind from having no reason to understand. Oh. And he had one on, well, how is it, how would I do science differently than someone who has no faith? Uh-huh. Uh, his poster was about how to encode that in how we communicate science, how yeah. we write it up, mm-hmm. that it's something that's, that's not put our knowledge, our knowledge is in. We're not idolizing this or not. Mm-hmm. It's always going to be closely with the person, the me, the scientist, the generous, the, mm-hmm. how I relate with charity and the mm-hmm. community, mm-hmm. how I'm putting it out there for the benefit of the human community, mm-hmm. yeah. and that helps purify it from uh, hyper competitiveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As if the science really isn't your own. I mean, God created the physical universe for all of us. Yeah. So you're finding it, you're not finding creating it. it. Mm-hmm. There's a sense of humility. Yeah. And, um, and probably are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did that come up in our conversation with the Marine Convict, or did that come up in her talk where she was talking about, I made this fly? I almost think that was in our I think it was in our podcast. Yeah. 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 So that was, yeah. So that yeah. would be yeah. funny enough for me. Yeah, but there's that certain attitude in science, and of course, in particular in biology. Yeah, you know, I've encountered that before. Yeah. My, my, Biochemistry lab, you know, going rah rah rah. Let's go make DNA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From yeah. you must have to ask them yeah. from what part from, that pre-exists. What is inside of it? What's more than people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It helped me to understand the, the the tendency toward atheism in science better than I had ever understood it before. God as a competitor, <laughs> yeah, right to what. He would be, you know, he instilled, God instilled in us this desire to know more mm-hmm. and to have as much yeah. knowledge and control yeah. in, the, in, the, in the best stewardship sense. That's what Connor kind of talks about. Is that, yeah? The tree, the tree of, life, of knowledge. Right? We yeah. could grasp it, we could weaponize it behind God's back, we yeah. want to grab the gnosis right. instead of being taken up into theosis right. to learn to become like God. Right? Yeah. Right. Receive his call. Right. Yeah. We want to take the object of, we want to. Take the, you know, they say, don't seek the 
constellations God, the God of constellations, and we want to yeah. take the object yeah. and we idolize that yeah. as knowledge. I liked how he said that about the truth. Yeah, that's a good thought. Yeah, I thought so too. And then he's wearing, you know, thinking about all the words and soul is the same, but also. Um, Barshavardas was saying, oh, uh, yes, our previous uh, uh, a few little while back, um, there's a sense that can get our sense with God can get tangled up with our sense with our parents. Mm -hmm. If we don't trust, you know, mm -hmm. our better for our parents to do right. yeah. And there are people who who go through their experience. Life includes legitimately not being able to trust their parents. Right, yeah. right. And there are people who, whose life includes for reasons that are not their parents' fault or even do their parents actually doing anything wrong, they come to that conclusion that they can't trust their parents to do what's good for them. Right. And that, that sense of, yeah, I'm going to take this apple or I'm going to take this thing and put it in my pocket and save it for myself because I can't depend on right. it being provided to when I need it. Right. I think that attitude of openness is also the same attitude, the opposite of what you're talking about, this mm -hmm. attitude of openness to whatever God has for you. It's the same attitude that that you need to have in terms of the natural world. That's another thing Connor was saying, I think, is that this attitude of total openness to the phenomena at hand, like letting things hate you as they are, rather than as your category, the categories you've already got in your mind are telling you they have to be. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a good point, that trust in God. Yeah. It's an important question. This is precisely what um, the second topic Mr. UK. Oh, Nathan? Or Mytha? Yeah. I almost think I heard him on Friday night say that his name was actually. So after that. We're sorry. We're sorry about that. Sorry. I was sitting beside Father Javier and he turned to me and he said, Well, how do you put those two talks together? And we were both pretty loud by his name. I mean, yeah. it's wow. I was wow. It was yeah. it's fascinating. It was fascinating. It's and fascinating. so then he, he, I sat down there at lunch and he said, uh, and I asked him, so I put that, can you put what you're saying together for the first talk? Mm -hmm. And then he said, uh, well, it's just beyond me. Oh, did you understand any of it? <laughs> <laughs> and then we started talking about, um, you know, And he said, well, how do you do science differently? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an important question to think about. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think so. I'm thinking about it all weekend. Yeah. Einstein said that the only true science can come from that motivation. The motivation to sort of delve into the, the mystery, you know, the mystery of God and the cosmos. Yeah. I think it really does have to do with um, the foundation of our relationship with cosmos. Mm -hmm. Logos, you know, can only get us so far. Mm -hmm. yeah. Science can only get us so far. Right. But, but mythos, but purified, right. true mythos, revealed mythos, can take us beyond what we can know because it's beyond the grasp. It's right. too far back in the origins of mm -hmm. where right. things are going in our destiny, how I, how I relate to everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you have a revealed faith, that depends on. The other shell is talking to us. We have to be ready to accept that if that's, if that's how it has to be. If, mm -hmm. if there's some critical component, we have to get that way. Yeah, and you can see this in Father Nicanor's thought on um, Geometry and Christmas. Mm -hmm. The intuition is developed. And, yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What you made about um, this intuition he developed? Like, um, he was talking about the difference between secular bioethics and Catholic bioethics. Right. It's human dignity. Yes. Yes. So, what's in each of us, our capacities, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the image of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, our intrinsic value versus what the world sees as the, our, you know, the extrinsic value of a person. And you break yeah. right out of the tent, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Where you talk to the world, so I can Yeah. But the human person is. Yeah. Otherwise, we get caught up in the logic of technology and ends up ruining us. Right, right. The ending. I was trying to picture the ending of this talk was pretty powerful when he said, "You know, we always have to have that the preferential, the, the uh, what's it called, the preferential option, option. for the poor." Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
mm-hmm. when doing medicine. I think it's so important to remember. Yeah. I've been thinking about this a lot too, about purpose of medicine in terms of cancer research. Mm-hmm. Is it to am I a warrior in a war to kill the death? Mm-hmm. Is the purpose of, med- of medicine to cure death, or is it to heal sometimes? Yeah. And comfort always mm-hmm. is the main thing. Love and, and yeah. medical attention is a, is a wonderful way to love. The loving happiness and yeah. Well, be well and go your way, and the person yeah. starving and shivering. Right. 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 But in the end, love is in the end. Mm. It's not that killing death, defeating death. Right. I'm putting that on your CD. Right. Having, right. having <laughs> a this worldly, yeah. this worldly. Yeah. Mother Teresa would agree with you, that's for sure. Yeah, with she could, with all the work she did, I mean, she was trying to give people advanced chemotherapy and do uh, all the stuff we do in, in our institution. Which probably the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Or people or something. Right. Yeah, right. 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 The latest dose of the latest chemotherapy, they want their hand held. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's well, contextual passing away? And yeah. it's contextual. It has to do with the resources on hand, what's mm-hmm. there, the kind of situation. Right. What is a loving thing to do? Mm-hmm. It depends. What's all the other things I have to take care of in my life? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's always, maybe that's, we, we can't escape that responsibility of. We need enlightenment, we need to ask for that grace to see what the best thing is to do, and then we need to take the responsibility of doing the pragmatic things to figure it out and do it and implement. Mm-hmm. That's why I asked that question, you know, and asked the question to Christopher Rom, who we have talked about tissue engineering, gene human nature. Ask him, well, what is the science? What's really motivating people who yeah. are in this field? Is it mm-hmm. the desire to live forever? Is it to to be, you know, is it to be in the world? There's just like these, uh, uh, there's a foundation that uh, is promoting sort of life extension research, and there's kind of mainstream YouTube videos that talk about, well, maybe the, the, the first immortal is already among us. Wow. Right? It's, right. it's not right. woo woo stuff mm-hmm. out there. It's actually yeah. being it's, researched. So people yeah. are clicking on this and it has however many hundreds of thousands of views and yeah. they're giving ten dollars yeah. a month and crowdfunding campaigns. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. amazing. It's, it's the real good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I asked them, well what's the subject? Is it is it the desire to take one and grasp and to be a winner? Mm-hmm. And to or is it to is it to care, is it to heal, is it to love? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't you can't always know that from the paper. Right. What's inside of people? What's motivating them? Right. right. No. We were talking about that the first night. What What is it that makes people want to achieve death so badly? Too. What is it that makes people so inclined to want to live forever? And I, I asked, I was asking uh, Jeff the question. Do you think it's because their life is so good they can't picture an ending? Do you think it's because they're afraid of death, or it's, do you think it's because they think there really is nothing after this life? And I suppose either. Any of those three could be a motivation, but I wonder what's the dominant one. You know, it's a good yeah. question to ask colleagues at lunchtime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a car over a coffee, whatever. Right. 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 Yeah, the world's not good for them. They have some space to talk. Mm-hmm. I know that what I mean by that is very different from what many people I work with mean by that. Mm-hmm. I think that this is just absolutely different. Yeah. What can I, what wisdom can I, how much can I really expect that we would agree yeah. on, on certain issues if we have such a fundamental, I mean, I do want to live forever. Mm-hmm. Not, yeah. not in a disworldly way, but I don't want not to like, stop existing. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. It's just yeah. an interesting question. It's pretty scary, right? You, yeah. You know. But I also wonder, what, what really baffles me is, I mean, when you look at people like Camus, who asks, why don't people just commit suicide if there's no ultimate meaning in life, um, then why are people who, who 
who uh, you know don't believe there's anything afterwards? Why are they trying so hard to extend their life on Earth? Do they love it that much? And that's a good thing if that's the driving motivation. But I don't know if that's it. I don't know. Yeah. Let's see. I'll have to talk to some more people. Is it, is it purely on an instinctual level? But, you know, I mean, this is the you know trying to look at it from that philosophical standpoint. Well, you know, I just have this desire because evolution put it into me, and you know, if my genes had right. for this desire to uh, to keep existing, then you know, my ancestors wouldn't have survived long enough to reproduce, and I wouldn't be here. Right. And I'm just and I'm just a product of my genes anyway. My you know my DNA is my master, and so DNA and circumstances govern what I do anyway. So why should why should I worry about it? Right. You know, so I'm just going to do it. All the tracks. Do. Yeah. Well, I guess to some degree, uh, death is the ultimate humiliation, oh. right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't get this this world right. I'm, uh, uh, you know, losing losing this worldly life. Oh. Uh, but that's that's, that's what's so refreshing about a conference like this. Um, not humiliation, but hum <laughs> but. Uh, 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 very wise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> humbly. Humbly. Sort of I'll finish it for you. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> with, that, with that humility, one can, uh, it opens up a lot of freedom for discussions mm -hmm. and for yeah. admission of, you know, not knowing everything mm -hmm. and being able to ask questions in a very productive way and not trying to lord it over other people that you know more than they do, right. etc. And that's why it's, I found it to be such a congenial uh, and collegial yeah. uh, experience. It's a, it's a nice atmosphere here. I mean, yeah. it makes me remember, like, well, it's actually this that's normal. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, yeah. this, this is all here, yeah. all, all systems go, and yeah. like, people are yeah. are kind of uh, locked into their their gizmos when they're, yeah. when they're yeah. kind of uh, when they're cursed yeah. with uh, anxiety and stress. Like, mm -hmm. what's well, actually like, maybe maybe a lot of the people I interact with are, yeah. have, have that kind of uh, yeah. uh, equilibrium, and that's the, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's the thing that's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what's in the Yeah, I yeah. know, yeah, it's only a small part of the year, but I look forward to it every year because it is, it's such a treat to be around people that want to talk about ideas and are formed in their faith and yeah. Yeah. very positive environment. And, and I love that uh, several people echoed that sentiment at the membership meeting mm -hmm. this afternoon. That this is something they look forward yeah. to all year round, oh, and great. that they would pay a much larger yeah. membership dues. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. and it would be kind of nice to be able to extend that into the rest of the year. I heard some people talking about, "Oh, how can we do this then? How yeah. can we have these sort of interactions?" I know I got a whole bunch of people's emails that I keep. Good. I mean, we right. yeah. Yeah. Some emails. Yeah. 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 It's nice to keep in touch a little bit when you're in a place that there's no one else in your department that wants to talk about. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. essential. Yeah. Yeah. I met some possible writing buddies. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah. It's good to have collaboration. I mean, that's where I think so many of the biggest ideas in history came from collaborative efforts, right? Like, look at the early days of quantum physics. Those were all the, you know, the German collaborators, right? Yeah. Like, it's all yeah. back. And, you have to bounce your ideas off of somebody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they had tea so, get together. Really yeah. Walks together. They did skits. They did like they fun skits. They need lunch on <laughs> their laptops, right? Know, right. Yeah, exactly. Talk. Apparently, they did a skit making fun of Einstein at one of their Christmas no dinners way. together. No. Yeah, but he was a good sport about it. I think it was Einstein they were making fun of. Right. Hopefully, it wasn't Paul Ernst. That's, I think he committed suicide at some point. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's probably been a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> You can edit that part out if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, and it's also, and, you know, and, and, yeah, I'm a geologist, so not an oppressive environment. It's not like being a person of faith in the in the hot house that is biology, from my understanding of it. I mean, I would just walk through the hall because they were on the first floor, and I was on the fourth floor at Illinois State. Yeah. And I would walk through the hall on the first floor to go to the bathroom because the auditorium was down there. We had a cloak. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's anti-religious screeds up on the wall really? on the way to the bathroom. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that was just the environment. Mm -hmm. um, At my institution, at the University of Canada, that, I hope. they in the training I had, I kind of you go through these slides and help you look at places. They they make uh, an emphasis on um, part of. Um, being 
inclusive of diverse people is letting people be themselves, including their religious identity. Yeah. And so I'm very happy. I felt very supported. And, mm -hmm. and they said sort of in a way, it was like, well, more and more people that have a faith identity are expressing that they experience workplace discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be subtle great. sometimes, yeah. you know? Right. Yeah. It doesn't have to be so, someone, uh, yeah. it can be someone who just doesn't give you uh, space to be yourself. Right. Right. But I definitely don't want to experience that. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Well, I was, we just had Aid. We just, I work with a mother colleague, and they have oh, their cool. son close to Ramadan. You are not allowed to fast on that day. You have to feast and be happy. Oh. Right. Right. And right. so we brought out Swedes. Oh, and, oh yeah. Uh, and yeah. yeah, a lot of the people I work with aren't, oh, maybe they have a Muslim right. background, but they're believers of practicing. Uh -huh. But they're, they have their memories of their family also mm -hmm. having this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he's, he can be himself. And he does better work because of it. Yeah, yeah. it's important. Yeah. My students all just went through Ramadan, my, my summer school students, because I teach ESL. Uh, anyway, so okay. I know that the, the same thing there, there's like a sense of openness about all these different faiths, which is nice to see. Part of being human. Yeah. Yes. Spirituality is really a, a it's respectable. part of our anthropology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually part of being human rather than something that we should, you know, package up and minimize and push out to the world as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, even at that, I was just bringing that in the context of even going to geology conferences where the culture is not that hostile to religion. There are some people who are, you know, believe that all religions or are the other creationists, and that's another story. But um, but even then, I feel like I am kind of checking part of my identity at the door. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some of my personality, and I'm, I'm making more of it than I really you know, would if I hadn't been through certain earlier experiences that I'm, I'm still sort of carrying with me. I, I know one, uh, one I read a biography of one of the geologists, Captain Jones, and the University of Toronto is society, Yosu Svoboda. He's an interesting, he wrote his autobiography recently. I'm going to okay. give you the reference, but he went through a lot. He, he was thrown into communist gulag in his right. early 20s wow. because he did, like, ran a letter from A to B when he was on the first year of university, and then six months later, uh -huh. that was just it. The next thing, for that, 10 years in the gulag, got out. Wow. Of, 20s burn and then yeah. tried to get on with his life. Yeah. He had ended up having an extremely good education yeah. in those prison camps because he had really like, people that had formed their own like prison universities. Yeah. Okay. Like, well, like, I think the prisoner's too. Vatican, the Mukul was Vatican. Oh. Uh, and then he bought out, but he was always black for He was always oh. can't study here and black is like so he just fled, he fled to Canada. Wow. Yeah. And from the day he landed Four or five years later, he had finished his PhD, finished wow. his studies, got his PhD, and got an assistant professorship. Also. That is yeah. so inspiring. And he did these trips to the Arctic, and he wrote about how he experienced the natural world, about wow. yeah. how, you know, seeing Earth, how, you know, history, how everything had developed yeah. um, right there in the Arctic, mm -hmm. the stones upturned. And, That's inspiring. And uh, it's an amazing letter from. I forget uh, his name. Uh, uh, Czech Republic. Uh, 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 sort of encouraging him. Uh, mm. uh, cool story. Reminds me of Walter Chizik's story. Because he had the same experience learning philosophy and theology in the camps. He called it like the University of Lubyanka, the prison camps. Mm. Yeah. 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 He used to time well. <laughs> <laughs> we have no excuse here in the United States. No, yeah. no yeah. first world problem. <laughs> yeah. If you enjoyed this episode, or it made you think, please subscribe to That's So Second Millennium via Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, or your podcast service of choice.